All right, thank you. Um, so for, yeah, for those who don't know me, I'm the president of Sonic Concepts. Um, our at Sonic Concepts, our, our vision is we create the best and most versatile non-invasive therapeutic ultrasound systems to improve and save lives every day. Um, we, uh, the, the topic in which I'll be talking about is the, the physics behind uh, ultrasound simulation and to prove to all of you that it's not black magic and that this uh, there, there's a bunch of physics and material science going on behind the surface in which uh, it is applied to the patient uh, behind the scenes. And to go over that and then really some simple navigation tools in order to understand how uh, ultrasound propagates through certain uh, tissues and mediums. All right, so I'd like to start off just by presenting the uh, the basic frequency range in which sound is uh, is determined. So um, anything above 20 kilohertz is considered ultrasound. And so um, the audible frequencies for humans is between uh, 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz. And so we normally work between 100 kilohertz and up to five megahertz in, in therapeutic ultrasound, normally a little bit on that lower frequency end for penetrating skull and bone tissue. So uh, a little bit about how, how does, how, how can we interpret uh, ultrasound? It's really a mechanical phenomenon. Um, it's vibration and waves. So a vibration source in a mechanical medium causing a wave propagation. Uh, it can't exist in a vacuum. And it's really not transferring mass as much as energy. If you think of a rock being thrown into a pond of water, you're not transferring the water. You're, you're transferring the energy about the, the, the water. A longitudinal wave, by definition, is a particle movement from a medium that induces wave wave propagation in the same direction. So this uh, little video on the bottom of that shows uh, lambda, which is a wavelength, and you can see it's compressing and decompressing. So uh, the, the compression part of that, where, where those uh, particles are bunched up, uh, it causes the local medium density and pressures uh, varying with time. The, the density or pressure with increase when it is compressed. Uh, the rare fraction is when the low pressure passes through, the local density will decrease, as you can see through that animation. So some terminology and general parameters, we talk a lot about frequency. Uh, the frequency is the number of times a, a vibrating particle goes through its original position within a second. So the unit is in hertz. And for ultrasound, the frequency is around the megahertz, as I was discussing, but in the kilohertz for, for skull propagation. Uh, the wavelength is the distance between the two adjacent wave peaks, as you can see uh, in A. The, the amplitude um, is the maximum distance of a particle moves away from the original position. So um, from peak to peak is a wavelength. And then um, wave where amplitude is is uh, the vibrate the, for the vibration is the amplitude and the maximal distance of a particle as it moves away from the original position. The wavelength duration is the number of wave cycles generated by the transducer each time it is pulsed. So a, a narrow bandwidth transducer tends to have more cycles than a, a broader bandwidth transducer. Some more terminology, so pressure. So wave propagation can be defined as the particle vibration around their balance position. So pressure causes this particle to move. So the high pressures are achieved when more neighboring particles move inward. And conversely, low pressure is generated when, a, when particles move outward. The power is uh, when the, since the particles are vibrating, uh, it possesses kinetic velocity and energy. So an ultrasound source will generate energy, and this energy is divided by uh, divided by time is power. And then intensity is the power per unit area. And then the bandwidth is the portion of the frequency response that falls within a specific amplitude limit. 
so the industry standard uh, to define bandwidth um, with respect to uh, uh, ultrasound and acoustic propagation is 6 dB. So that's half amplitude. So what's going on in uh, that transducer? Um, there, there's the, the, the major contributor to these ultrasound components um, for those working in the piezo electric field is it's called the piezoelectric effect. So piezoelectricity is the ability of some materials to generate an electrical potential in response to applied mechanical stress and conversely generated applied mechanical stress in response to electrical potential. So this is transmission. Uh, the material that shows piezoelectricity is called uh, the, uh, the piezoelectric material. So it's really an electrical charge. It's electrically charged on both sides, as you can see on this diagram um, of a piece of piezo electric material, and it will create enough stress within the material to deform. If the electrical charge is al alternative, the piece of material will oscillate and generate a mechanical wave. Uh, the coupling coefficient is the thickness mode. Mechanical electrical coupling coefficient is a a key in indicator of piezoelectricity performance of the piezoelectric material. So by definition, it is the ratio of energy sent out to the energy stored by the material. So pretty much without piezoelectricity, a ceramic plate with two sides and then coated with these electrodes will simply behave as a capacitor. But with piezoelectricity, we develop a resonance, which is defined by the material type and the material thickness. So it's electrical impedance of that uh, will contain a real and imaginary part, which I'll show you in a little bit. And this real part of which will consume the electrical energy, energy and convert it into acoustic energy. So these are uh, some, some types of piezoelectric materials. We have ceramics, we have crystals, and we have polymers. Uh, the ceramics and crystals of which of which can be constructed as composite uh, to increase their Q. Uh, some of these high power ceramics that we're using for transmission ultrasound, um, it, it's called PZT. So lead zirconate titanate um, defined by the Navy type one. Um, it's a, so PZT4, it's considered a hard PZT. So it can handle higher amounts of power uh, based off it, of its dielectric and coupling coefficient. And so these are some parameters we use in the, in the simulations to dictate how we want to construct a transducer. All of these have a very critical role in the way in which we want the transducer to behave. Okay, so you, then let's talk a little bit about the acoustic properties of, of mediums in which we transfer the energy into. Um, so air uh, is uh, only low frequency can really propagate air. Um, the the speed the speed of uh, sound is three hundred meters per second, and it has it, it's very attenuative. The acoustic impedance of air is nearly zero. I think it's four hundred radials. Water. Uh, the sound velocity in water is around 1500 meters per second at room temperature. Uh, water has a very little attenuation to ultrasound. The acoustic impedance of water is about 1.5. So we really talk about a water environment as our linear free field um, as it is virtually attenuous. Soft tissue is similar to water. Um, so 1540 meters per second, but the, the attenuation is higher around 0.3 dB per centimeter per hertz, megahertz. And the acoustic impedance of soft tissue is around 1.5 megarails, very similar to water. And then bone uh, is much faster than soft tissue in terms of sound velocity. And the bone is highly attenuative, obviously, and it requires lower frequencies to penetrate, such as the skull. So here's a diagram of a general construction of a transducer. On the left is an exploded view. What we're calling the transducer is the piezoelectric material. Uh, you can couple this to what's called a wear surface, wear plate. Um, and a lot of times we use what's called a matching layer. 
that matching layer I'll, I'll discuss in a little bit. Here's a backing layer, um, another way to tune the, the piezoelectric material and then it's placed in a housing. And then on the right hand side are some diagrams showing the different ways to really focus the energy. Um, you know, you can use a, an unfocused source and then you can use uh, a lens in front of it where depending on how you want to focus or defocus, it, the lens can be um, a, a fast sound velocity lens or a, a slow velocity lens. Um, but if you want to really focus it with the transducer itself and avoid using a lens for, for reasons to, for example, increase efficiency, you would curve that into a, a, a concave spherical bowl. And then all the layers would be in that shape and you put them together and put it into a housing. So how do we calculate the applied mechanical stress in response to an electrical potential? Well, there's uh, simulation tools out there. Um, the, the one that Sonic Concepts likes to use is a, a linear or a KLM model. Um, so it's a 1D propagation tool. Uh, in this model, you can see uh, V3 and uh, I3 are the respective voltage and current applied to the piezoelectric material, which produce acoustic forces F and particle velocities U at the respective faces of the crystal. So after a bunch of math, this model is used to determine the input impedance of the piezoelectric material. Uh, the, the simulation tool Sonic Concepts use, and we it's actually uh, the, the first product we actually started selling uh, in starting in 1980 is PiezoCAD. So it's a, a world renounced, uh, renowned uh, uh, simulation tool that is this KLM model. Um, it's rapid, um, you can iterate very quickly in order to achieve the results in which you're trying to uh, achieve. It uses a chain matrix technique to calculate the overall system characteristics from the electrical terminals to the front acoustic port. So here's an example. Um, here we're representing a piece of ceramic with no piezoelectricity. In other words, this could be uh, represent PZT4 with random domains before pulling is performed. So this is simply a capacitor that we're showing here. Notice there's no resonance about the frequency band. It's, um, uh, the, for, for example, this is a one megahertz transducer, 10 millimeter flat disc, um, and then it's coupled to uh, free field or, or water. So what's in between uh, this, this ceramic uh, capacitor and a piezoelectric device? So piezoelectric ceramic, ceramic has many small regions inside it, and these, these regions are called domains. And each domain has its own piezoelectric direction. Uh, when an internal stress is introduced, some domains give positive charge if they are lined up according to the stress direction. Uh, some domains may give very minimal charge if its uh, own direction is perpendicular to the stress direction, and some domains will give negative charge if it's against the stress direction. Uh, the domains are very small on the order of a few hundred of microns, a few to hundreds of microns, and are randomly distributed. So with it, without special processing to line up all these domains, the material will not show as piezoelectric. So the polling process used, um, it's, a, it's a high DC voltage and it's applied on both sides of the piece of material for a short duration of time, about one to 10 seconds. And then various materials and operating conditions require, require different voltages to reverse the domains. And this voltage is called uh, the coer coercive voltage. Okay, so using the same exam example before, and instead of just a capacitor, we're introducing this Navy type one PZT4, uh, which can handle a high amount of power. Um, the major 
uh, parameters that I want to show you. Um, we're using two millimeters thick uh, PZT4, and its coupling coefficient is 0.5. And we're going to apply that to the piezocad model. So instead of this capacitor showing over the frequency spectrum, you can see there's a resonance with the two millimeter thick pie uh, piezoelectric material. You get a, a resonance around one and then every odd harmonic from there. So there's one megahertz, three megahertz, about, you know, about five and then seven. It's actually about uh, 3.3, 5.5, 7.7 based off of Poisson's ratio. But uh, this is an example of, you know, those domains are pulled and they're, they're now creating a resonance when, um, when, uh, when you apply a voltage to it. So as we zoom in, you can see um, where that resonance is defined, the parallel resonance is at one megahertz. The anti-resonance is this peak. So you have your, uh, you have your resonance at one and your peak at about 1.2, and that's what defines your coupling coefficient. So using that same simulation, instead of looking at electrical impedance, this is what the, the transmit efficiency looks like. So for every one electrical watt at one megahertz into water, you're able to achieve uh, uh, 0.89 watts of acoustic energy. The other energy is not converted. And we'll discuss what that's converted to later. And then you can use the efficiency and the impedance to derive uh, transmit transfer function. So at the end of the day, the user wants to know how many, how many Pascals are they getting for every voltage applied to the ceramic. So this transmit transfer function describes that using the impedance and efficiency and back of the envelope math to come up with, in this example, 11 kilopascals per volt. But the bandwidth is really narrow, and that's not good in terms of being, being able to handle different mediums in which you're coupled to. So we really need to increase the bandwidth. So this is just a piece of piezoelectric ceramic. So what we want to look at eventually is what happens with a matching layer. Um, just to go over some quick math, um, to convert the with the impedance, you actually use what's called the conductance. The math is here if you want to come back and look at it later. But you can use that conductance with the voltage to define the power. You apply, you multiply the power by the efficiency to come up with total acoustic power. So now you have total acoustic power and then the area of your aperture. So in terms of watts over centimeter squared is intensity. Now you have everything you need to calculate your, your intensity. Um, from intensity, you can calculate pressure, assuming water is your uh, propagation medium. So here's an example of what I showed you before. So the efficiency of just piezoelectric material on the left, and then adding a quarter wave matching layer on the right. So I wanted to increase the bandwidth um, and we've we've done that here, as you can see, and we've also increased the transmit efficiency with this quarter wave matching layer. So how does that affect the transmit transfer function? So again, I'm presenting on the left, the narrow band, and then with the matching layer, we're now above 50% bandwidth, which is optimal. So this is showing a decrease. So you're giving up sensitivity and, and well, transmit, voltage uh, to open up the bandwidth here. So you're creating this null to uh, have a more uniform um, operating uh, band. So voltage to surface intensity, these are the, the calculations. So some quick math, pressure to intensity. So to, to calculate pressure, it's the square root of intensity by rho C, which is essentially your impedance. So, an example of that is using 
before this, or it's here, 3.67 kilopascals per, per volt um, at one megahertz. So um, first we, we take the intensity of which we are at, let's assume we're at 30 watts per centimeter squared. Um, 30, 30 watts per centimeter squared into water is 0.667 millipascal or megapascals RMS. And it's actually one megapascals peak, which is a good way to define the, the peak amplitude in which is penetrating the patient. So taking this uh, 667 kilopascals over that uh, transmit transfer function allows us to define the peak voltage. So 257 volts peak results in 30 watts per centimeter squared at the surface. So it's, we, we don't just apply a transducer to a driver, we try to optimize it. Most of our transmit drivers industry standard matches these, the source impedance is about 50 ohm zero degrees. So here we have a transducer with a load impedance of 650 ohms and negative 62 degrees. We need to match it. So we like to use ideal transformers to do this, to sustain uh, and, and reduce losses, sustain the bandwidth in which, which was 50% uh, uh, while uh, while uh, reducing that impedance to 50 ohms and getting rid of the reactance of the imaginary part of the impedance. So the, this is a a, a, um, for, uh, a calculation in which we use to calculate. I'm going to go down here to you know we use a, a transformer is defined by it as a shunt inductor to cancel out the reactive component of the impedance. And then you use a turns ratio on that transformer to bring it down from 667 ohms to 50 ohms. So in this case, it's 117 microhenries and 5.3 turns ratio. And the results of that when putting it into piezo cat are on the right here. So you show we're about 50 ohm zero degrees at one megahertz. What does that look like in terms of power transfer? Well, without matching, look at this red curve. We we're down half, uh, half well, yeah, so 6 dB uh, in terms of power transfer. That's a quarter of the power, and it goes down to about uh, 9 dB. So you're wasting a lot of power in terms of reactive power without matching it. So we're able to improve bandwidth and power transfer using this, this transformer. So it's almost more important to get your power transfer right um, than transmit efficiency in a lot of cases. Okay, so we're ready to use this transducer. So the transducer in this case will need 182 volts to reach 30 watts per centimeter squared at the surface. Um, so we, we, we look at this voltage and say, is it, is will the transducer survive? Yes, it's a third of its theoretical withstanding voltage of the piezoelectric material. Um, at 100% of the withstanding voltage, this device would reach up to 275 watts per centimeter squared, over 50% bandwidth. So these are highly efficient transducers. To reach 182 volts into the transducer, the amplifier actually outputs only, only 43 because of that turns ratio. There's 280 milliamps of current, 51 watts of apparent power, 13 watts of reactive power. Um, and so at the end of the, uh, at, by the time we're, we're worried about heat generating heat at the transducer, we look, well, 30 watts, we, we know based off of the efficiency that we're only emitting about three watts of heat, which the transducer can definitely survive. So past the radiating surface, <clears throat> um, if you look at a flat aperture, there's this simple calculation we use. So it's diameter squared over four times the wavelength. And that defines this transition plane where these peaks and valleys stop. And it, it so out here at the end of N, the near field transition plane, 
we call that the far field. And so it, it's not um, confer- converging. Um, it's starting to diverge once it reaches the end of N. And that's essentially the, the focal plane of an unfocused transducer. Uh, here's an example of, you know, the, the, uh, the unfocused transducer compared to if we focus it, an unfocused aperture. So we're using the same uh, example as before, the D squared over four lambda is about 16 millimeters. And you can see this blue line, it, it reaches a focal gain of two maximum. And these near field secondary lobes reach two. So that's not good if you're focusing or if you're trying to uh, treat uh, within the patient, these, these near field secondary lobes will uh, uh, affect um, the, the unintended tissues. So using that same 10 millimeter aperture, but applying a 10 millimeter radius of curvature, that's considered an F1 device, it reaches three times the pressure gain of an unfocused transducer. So these secondary lobes in the near field, you know, are, are well below that primary peak. So 30 watts per centimeter squared at the surface and a pressure gain of six, which is actually intensity gain of 36, will reach a free field pulse intensity of one kilowatt per centimeter squared. So that focusing helps us tremendously in terms of treatment, efficacy, and safety. You're not worried about hitting the collateral tissue in the near field. So some simple math here, pressure gain at the spherical aperture is the area over the radius of curvature times lambda. So simple rules of thumb, higher frequency, higher pressure gain. Lower F number, higher pressure gain. Um, so the F number, as it's the radius of curvature over the aperture diameter. A larger total aperture has higher pressure gain. So all these contribute to achieving as much pressure at the focus as possible. So attenuation can be defined. Uh, we, a lot of time we only think of it in terms of absorption, but there's scat the scattering component and reflections. So we define this in water. It's as described earlier. It's virtually attenuousless. Attenuousless um, blood it isn't that much um, worse than water, but it does have a little bit of attenuation. 0.03 dB. Soft tissue, you're, you're getting up to about 0.3 dB. So air, bone, stone, and metal will normally require frequencies lower than one megahertz. Otherwise, it will attenuate near, nearly all the energy um, in the field. And we can go through a few examples. Uh, ultrasound attenuation values increase with frequency. So, the effect of attenuation is shown here in blue is free field water and then you apply 2 dB attenuation a, a 2 dB attenuation coefficient and it reduces the pressure gain from 35 to 8 in this example so attenuation plays a big role we need to consider that here's uh, a diagram just for uh, describing some of the terminologies in how we define a focus transducer. Um, we, you know, the geometric focus is that this represents the, the uh, ellipsoid focal region. Um, and then it's transducer aperture plane distance here is the considered the penetration distance. So if the skin surface were at the aperture plane, the transducer aperture plane here, uh, you would have, in this case, five centimeters of propagation. So you have virtually no therapy in this region, and it's, it's focused to this point. So some of the applications, um, the, the, the uh, purpose of this is neuromodulation of this, this talk. Um, but we're a, because of our high efficiency in our transducers, we're able to reach very high pulsed power regimes and pulsed average regimes. So pulsed average is based off of thermally limiting your transducer and then 
peak pulse is based off of pretty much that withstanding voltage uh, limitation I was talking about earlier in combination with mode structures in the piezoelectric material. But these are some applications. So um, there's thermal and mechanical ablation. There's cavitation therapy, blood-brain barrier, drug combination devices, gene transfection, and histotripsy. And there's a few different types of histotripsy in which rips tissue apart and, and is considered mechanical ablation. So we follow the the medical standard or the IC standard 60601-2-62. So this is part particular requirements for basic safety and essential performance of high intensity therapeutic ultrasound equipment. So although we're not reaching high intensities for neuromodulation, we still abide by the same rules of thumb. We can replace this high with low. So the, the way in which the standard defines intensity is the pulse average, the peak pulse average intensity. So it's really that instantaneous peak pressure or peak intensity uh, that it can reach in the field. And then you have your spatial peak temporal average intensity where you apply your duty cycle, which is your burst into your, your pulse uh, length in or your burst length into your pulse repetition rate. So if you're 10 milliseconds into 100 milliseconds, your 10% duty factor, and then you apply that 10% duty factor into your pulse, and that's your your temporal average. So an example, uh, free field water. If it's pulse at the its pulse average intensity is 30 you have a, a pulse duration of 240 into 10 milliseconds. This is a duty cycle of 2.4. So your temporal average is 720 milliwatts per centimeter squared, which is the FDA limit. That's based off of the thermal index defined for your generic uh, ultrasound imaging probes. Um, so we, we consider the D-rated attenuation uh, factors of this. So in this example on the left is water, but um, the FDA wants you to apply the D-rated attenuated peak uh, average and temporal average. So marketing clearance of diagnostic ultrasound systems and transducers can be defined. Um, one thing I wanted to point out here is, for example, for any transducer intended for transcranial applications in which the ISPTA.3 exceeds 94 milliwatts, so that's much lower than the 720 milliwatts I was showing earlier, you should provide an estimate of maximum temperature rise attributed to the user of that transducer for each operating mode. So this is a, a pretty clear indication that we have to be careful on the thermal limits of these neuromodulation devices, even though they're low intensity. Uh, so NeuroFuss is the, the device that um, Sonic Concepts designs and builds um, in, com in collaboration with BrainBox and IST. Um, we, if you wanna learn more about it, you know, we're, we're, we're showing neurofuss.com there, um, but it, it's, a turnkey system and it allows for dynamic focusing along the axis. Um, there's ways to focus the, that ellipsoid focus in 3D. Um, at the moment, uh, we NeuroFuss, we have uh, six offerings that steer it just up and down. We're working on 3D versions of this. Um, <clears throat> but the real advantage of the pro system is that it comes with a software development kit that allows all the researchers in this field a, a portal of leveraging uh, public uh, pulse, pulsatility scripts and applying it to certain applications, you know, whether it's small animal, large animal, humans, whatever it is, and uh, applying those and, and learning from those and adding to the library if they iterate. And so we're generating this portal for the community to really work off of each other's work if, if uh, they're willing. 
this is a video showing uh, some functionality of the NeuroFus transducer itself. There, as you can see here, there's a, a handle, an ergonomic handle, and then it accepts a bio belt if you want to strap it to the patient so it's fixed. Um, I'm not going to play it now, but you can go back and, and uh, play this on your own. Uh, so how do we steer the focus up and down? We, we uh, divide the aperture. So we have a spherical hole and we divide it into a number of channels and elements. And we, the rule of thumb is to keep those equal area um, in order to generate uh, a focal steering script. Um, so the physics works out and it, it's much easier to implement from a systems integration perspective in creating, creating equal area elements. In this case, I'm showing four elements. So if we apply this to a 500 kilohertz transducer, and this is taking our CTX 504 channel as an example, the, the, the aperture is 64 millimeters diameter by 64 millimeters radius. So that it goes back to an example I showed earlier of how um, you're able to focus using an F1 device. That's divided into four equal area elements. And what we're showing here on the right is we're able to steer it anywhere between 20 millimeters to about 65 millimeters away from the uh, transducer's exit plane or, or the patient's uh, entry plane. And you can see that we're able to reach 30 watts per centimeter squared within, within reason while keeping these secondary lobes down here on the left below 6 dB. And so it's really important for all of us in the community to realize that there are grading lobes, secondary lobes here. And to learn from this and but to be to be aware that they, they are there, but do they matter? And that's where, you know, further investigation can be had in a 3D modeling um, tool. But the way we define this is free field water. And so we're showing here that yes, we're able to focus the, the focal length as defined from the start to end of each color here is representative of the, of the focus. As you steer inward to outward, the, the focus starts spreading and it becomes longer. So that's just the natural physics of what happens when steering using the same transducer. So now is an example of if you wanted to place a transducer in front of a TMS coil, you really want that thickness of the transducer to be as thin as possible. Well, one way to do that is by sacrificing the third and fourth element um, to get you a thinner device. And so here's the results of a two channel. Um, if I go, let's see, yeah, if I go back, you can see 20 to 65 steering range. So going to two, two channels, we reduce that a little bit. So we're maybe 30 to 55. So not too much of a sacrifice, but also looking at the focal length, you know, that's not as attractive as the four element, but it's a compromise. Uh, and this is an actual measure device. So the, the previous ones were shown in terms of simulation. Uh, so we, we uh, correct the focusing in-house using focal correction algorithms and then uh, in free field. And then we make sure that they're within 10% error from position and amplitude. So what's driving these transducers? We use what's called a, a TPO. It's a transducer power output system. It has its, it has its own signal generation, a user control environment, and amplifiers all in one box. And so um, we can go up to, you know, thousands of channels, but for what we're offering through Neurofus is up to uh, four channels for now. So it's a portable drive electronic package that we use to drive these multi-element transducers. Uh, the Neurofus Pro comes with power monitoring, which is really important to, 
to as a safety monitoring mechanism um, to monitor the real power going into these devices as things change as you couple the transducer to the skull and anywhere around the skull you're able to monitor the power change from one study to another and you can define you know if you need to shut off the system based off of that power you're measuring as a safety mechanism um, or you can use it to control repeatability so if you're if you're um, at one part of the skull one day and then you're trying to repeat that, you can baseline it based off of the electrical power curves generated by the system. So the Pro offers this functionality in combination with the SDK. So simulations, so 2D arrays for 3D focal steering. Um, on the left here, you can see these elements. This is a cross section and we're using an imaging probe uh, in the middle. To, to monitor, to, to really uh, guide our, our therapeutic focus. But the, these elements are arranged in an Archimedean spiral in this example. So uh, I wanted to show you some examples of sim simulating these 2D arrays. Uh, for the first example, we're showing a 400 kilohertz um, operating frequency. And in this case, you have 150 millimeter diameter and then 135 millimeter radius. And so this is considered a reasonable aperture to couple to the skull. 100, 128 channels and elements, and then each element is nine millimeter in diameter. So with all of those elements focusing coherently, meaning all of them have the same electrical phase, uh, they produce this focal region, which is about 140 millimeters. So it's a little shy of the geometric focus. And then you can see these near field grading lobes. Um, they're down 6 dB, but you can see it, we, need to, we need to monitor those. On the right hand side is the theoretical steering range of this transducer. So it's saying you can steer this focus on the left plus or minus 30 millimeters laterally and then along the axis from 7 to 20 centimeters. So it's got a very large treatment volume. And you can scan this focus within microseconds. Uh, in time about this theoretical uh, volume. So what happens when you increase frequency, and in this case, reduce the aperture of the diameter, you can see that the, the focus becomes a little bit smaller. It, it will become smaller relative to the ratio of frequency in which you're changing. So you go from 400 to 600, um, that two third, that three, three halves is cubed is the reduction in volume here. But you, you start to see the elements are smaller, so you don't have as much power density. These grading lobes be, become more prevalent. So we need to start watching that. Um, because of the, the aperture being smaller, four millimeters, you get a wider steering range. But these are the kind of trade-offs you have to look at when simulating. Yes, you get a smaller focus. Yes, you get more directivity, but you have grading lobes. So that's an example of just looking at trade-offs as you design a transducer. So for those who don't have simulation tools or looking for really quick back of the envelope calculations to define your steering range, uh, we've developed this online uh, transducer selection guide in which in this case, you, you go to our website, you click on the transducer selection guide and you can either model single element transducer parameters or these 2D array transducer selection guide algorithms. Um, here I'm presenting an example of how this works. Um, you have your inputs in white, your outputs in gray. And I'm using the same example as I showed earlier um, of uh, 400, 400 kilohertz and nine millimeter uh, sub apertures. So what we're showing here is the axial focal range, 144 and 57 
if you compare that to the model with a true simulation, it matches. So we're about 60 by 145. That's based, that's actually based off of the 3 dB limit. So you'll be looking at uh, 0.7. So that matches very nicely. And then you can also look at uh, how it compares to the focal length and the, the focal width and also the pressure gain. So you can see 16.1 and this red reaches about 16.1 and then 23 millimeters by three. So just a, an example of how accurate um, this back of the envelope calculator works. And then you change it to 0.6 as we did before and four millimeters. And similarly, uh, it outputs an axial range and a lateral range of focusing. And this complements uh, the, the simulation very well with respect to pressure gain. 4.8, 2.3 by 15.7. So this is a very useful tool. Um, I highly recommend it for people who are interested in the trade-offs of these, these um, pressure, focal size, and steering range um, as it applies to their application. So that's that's it in a nutshell. I'm happy to facilitate any questions anybody has. And of course, please contact me with any questions or visit our website for more information. Uh, thank you for your time and thank you Brainbox for the opportunity to uh, present on, on this topic.